Welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. So I recently had a chat with Dr. Sergio Canavero. I first heard about him when I interviewed Valerie Spiridonov, uh, who'd volunteered to be the first human head transplant donor. Um, that doesn't look like it's happening now because uh, Valerie uh, found love and decided to pull out of the uh, operation, thinking it's probably worth... Uh, his life has improved and he, th he feels like it's worth, uh, it's not worth taking the chance. But anyway, Dr. Canavero um, is continuing with his research. He's found a lot of resistance to his head transplant work and, I've, and it could be that secret work's been going along or uh, he's having to go to countries like China to continue the work. Um, he's also moved into other areas such as reanimation. The idea that we can bring people back to life who've been clinically dead for 12 hours or more with a view to he even thinks that it might be possible to bring back those people who've chirogenically frozen themselves um, and we're going to talk about those topics and topics of consciousness today uh, let me start by um, introducing our guests who are Seth and um, Phil who we, who's been on many of our shows and I want to start by asking uh, their general feelings and comments on doctors are attempting things like head transplants. Um, so first of all, welcome guys. Hey, there's Scott and Seth. Good to good to speak to you both again. Good to be here, guys. Good to talk to you. And uh, yeah, great to see you both. And uh, let's go straight over to Phil for your initial comments and feelings, just a general one on uh, Dr. Canavero's work on uh, attempting not just Dr. Canavera, anyone who who attempts these kind of head transplants. What's your what's your thoughts, Phil? Yeah, when when you first invited me on to on to, to come on this, I kind of looked at um, some of the things we we'd be discussing and I'm gonna be yeah, just totally honest about my direct experience of this, of just that question, like what are my what are my thoughts or comments on attempting things like head transplants? And I noticed on the surface, there's like there was a little bit of revulsion, some fear, and just looking at how that fear came up, it was it was kind of like images that were reminiscent of old childhood horror stories, things like Frankenstein and and various other yeah, just just old ghost stories and horror stories, and a little bit of revulsion, a little bit of of kind of stepping back, and and then there was a kind of curiosity underneath that sort of questioning the fear and revulsion like why what are the beliefs underneath that why do I why do I sort of feel a bit disgusted by that and I realized like if if that happened to one of my family members you know how, how would I feel if, if one of my my brother or something had his head removed and replaced with another head it would be really hard at first to um, to just kind of face that and see that as my brother um, and and then, there, yeah, there were lots of other thoughts around this, and I could talk for a, for a lot longer, but th these were sort of the, the most obvious ones. And there was a, a continuing thought about how courageous it is to even think about doing stuff like that, let alone kind of going into the research of it. And, um, and then it brought me to a little bit more curiosity of where the self revives, resides in the body. You know, it's not just a, a, an external face, but... You know, what do we consider makes up a, a certain person, a certain a certain character or self? And there are lots of different things involved in that. So that it sort of brought up a lot of questions, I guess. Where is the life force in someone? Uh, and is each life force unique to them, or is it a shared aspect of existence? And uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. And we'll be uh, covering some of those questions maybe uh, a bit later on. Uh, Seth, how about you? Your initial thoughts uh, before we move on to tackling some of these individual questions uh, well for me personally uh, as somebody that has spent a lot of time researching uh, in the 1800s uh, all the way to like late 1800s early 1900s of a uh, vivisection and all this sort of stuff uh, just as a history buff and a science buff and everything I absolutely used to adore door uh, that kind of information in general of understanding why people did a lot of this. Uh, not that I actually identify with wanting any of this sort of stuff. Uh, it's just that I've always found it very interesting of what motivates people to do it 
and personally the second you uh, told me that you wanted to have a talk on this dis- uh, uh, this topic it really brought up a lot of feelings in me of uh, of kind of disgust when it came to talking about the animal aspects and we'll talk about this in uh, a bit here but the lack of consent coming from uh, animals and everything that these experiments are being done on and the very idea of vivisection uh, which in certain countries is outright banned uh, should be kind of a, a talking point of this I understand this is going to focus a lot more on humans and in most cases uh, people that have given consent or in some cases not because they're you know cadavers but uh, we'll we'll get into it but I think it's going to make a very interesting discussion yeah, indeed. And um, when talking to Dr. Canavero, um, and when just looking into the, some of the work he's doing, there seems to be a lot of resistance from the medical profession itself, and not so much regarding the use of animals. Um, it seems to be more against the idea that he could do this. I find it a bit strange. Um, I've, I've always found, or, or, or more recently, I seem to be finding that the scientific profession, they really kind of... They're not quite as free thinking as I used to think they might be. Um, every, all the, all of the uh, people, um, uh, a lot of the science uh, medical profession are really against um, Dr. Canavero trying, but more on the basis that they don't think it's possible. Rather than talking about any ethics, they're, they're about um, that they don't think it's possible, which I, I find a bit strange. Um, but let's we can talk about some of the ethics uh, a bit later but why do you think the medical profession seem to be so against people trying the seemingly Im- impossible with a medical science um phil i think it's been like that for for hundreds of years you know it takes a, a kind of maverick it takes someone who's um who's not conforming to to the rest of society uh, to come up with some something that seems really out there it's that's that's really the the case with all create creativity uh, and the medical profession i think are generally taught to believe that they once they've done all of their uh, their studies they know everything that there is to know so that there's a lot of arrogance that comes along with that and it's fearful for for them it's fearful for anyone to be presented with new information and it comes back to a kind of primordial fear you know, we, we fear death and the ego is the thing that fears death. Uh, that's our sense of self. And the ego tends to identify with all of the bits of knowledge that it has, all of the bits of information. And so if the medical, if a doctor or the medical profession in general or scientists think they, they already know everything, they've kind of stopped learning. They've, they've stopped being a student of life. And uh, it's scary for them, it's scary for their egos to be presented with some new concept, some new idea that's a, a little bit kind of out there. So, yeah, new knowledge comes to light and the ego has no familiar, familiarity with it. And it becomes defensive and it starts going on the attack. It attacks whoever whoever is, is, um, is doing something different to what they think should be done. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Seth, how about you? Uh, never mind the ethics, and um, uh, which you know might be um, something that people would show resistance to. What about um, the medical profession trying impossible things? Do you think? Uh, why do you think there's uh, such resistance against that? I honestly don't know that I can say it any better than Phil already did. Uh, just in general people are going to resist that which is new or seemingly different uh whether or not i think any of this stuff is possible or any of these other people believe it's truly possible i think it's more uh as you've pointed out there as as did phil uh more based on fear and the fear that it might be true and then also the fear of the unknown of the fact that potentially this is something that people could do i mean Personally, I don't believe it can be, but the fact that there's somebody out there willing to try definitely scares the crap out of a whole lot of people that would rather have their own particular little worldview uh, reinforced over and over and over and over again. Because as Phil brought up, once people start to uh, identify with knowledge, with their ego and their, their identity of self, then they're going to be inclined to attack anything that comes from without. 
Yeah, and um, let, let's change the question slightly then to either of you, whoever wants to answer this one. Um, okay, let's move it on to should we be trying to do this? Um, do you think doctors should be pushing the boundaries, trying to do things that other doctors say are impossible or everyone says impossible, like transplanting a human head? Uh, I'll, I'll offer that to whoever wants to answer it. Do you want to go ahead first? Oh, oh okay. Uh, thank you. Um, do I think it's possible? No, I, I don't think it's possible. I think, though, uh, the idea of them trying it, honestly, as long as they're consenting parties, as uh, we had with uh, Valery Spiridonov that you were talking about earlier there, uh, and that you actually interviewed, in that particular case, I honestly have no problem with it in terms of what it actually represents. Uh, most of my particular problems with it come along with the ethics of doing this to unconsenting parties of animals and, and such that have no possible way to ever give you their consent for any of this. Uh, that's where I draw the line and I think that it starts becoming more uh, more horrific and much more along the lines of what people would identify as the Frankenstein type uh, monstrosity sort of stuff. But to a lot of people, animals don't have feelings don't they, they don't matter because you know they're of a different order of creature personally i'm not of this mind but a lot of people are and so i think it's it's something people are going to do regardless whether or not they should or not but it's still partly reflect or refreshing to see people pushing the boundaries of accepted science and medicine i don't think it's black and white and every time anyone says should should we be trying to do something or shouldn't we? Uh, I, I get very wary of shoulds. It's like, um, it's a little bit related to the previous question, you know, where there's a, we become comfortable with what we're familiar with. And, um, that, that kind of goes for a, a whole array of, of different aspects of life. And there are certain rules that we start getting tied into and it, it, um, and some people are comfortable with that. Some people kind of like to try and look outside those rules and, and break them in some sort of way, try to prove that they're wrong. So the shoulds are, are kind of a, a bit out for me. Um, someone may not want to be brought back. So I think it needs to be proceeded with really carefully, this whole this whole area. And as Seth has brought up, you know, the, the whole idea of animals not being able to give consent, you know, that's one thing. Um, and there's also, you know, it, if, if there's someone who is willing to donate their body to this kind of scientific research, then great. And if they're willing to sort of say, like, yeah, if, if uh, there's a possibility of you bringing, bringing me back after I've been dead for, for a fairly, fairly long while, um, then, then say, then try if you want to. But I'm not sure how many people would actually want that, how many people would be able to give consent to, to that. So um, it's, it's a, a difficult question to ask. Uh, you're a very busy man. I mean, you're an Italian neurosurgeon and um, mm -hmm. you attracted a lot of media attention in about 2015 with the, the human head transplant cr uh, claims. That hasn't happened yet, right? Is that, um, is that still going ahead? Well, uh, first of all, it's uh, 2013, not 15. 15 was the coverage of uh, the scientist. But... Uh, I, I, let me tell you what I can reveal is that I, I actually it just been um, uh, just went online today uh, because I just released uh, an interview to Portuguese media outlet and uh, so everybody should know very soon but uh, let me tell you exactly how uh, how it went as you remember in November 2017 I, I made an announcement that the first uh, full head swap and uh, human cadavers already taken place, and that we were ready to proceed uh, with a uh, with a live one. Uh, Twenty four hours after my announcement, actually something incredible, actually astonishing happened. That is, the Vatican and America's uh, liberal academe just banded together 
to try and bring a stop to the whole procedure, to the whole bandwagon, uh, that meant that we made serious enemies out there. Uh, that means that means that uh, I'm no longer, a, as I said to the Portuguese, uh, we just been working in a, in secret, uh, sub rosa, uh, not just in China but uh, in other places around the world, with people, of course, who don't want to be disclosed. Uh, so I can tell you this, and this I can confirm that human head transplants are totally feasible. In March. This year, as you probably are aware, USA Today um, reported uh, our breakthrough with monkeys and dogs and all the world could see them um, rewalking uh, totally back to, say, 95% normal. And that's as far as I can go. So I can tell you that the technology has been tested uh, across the board. It works uh, fully and human head transplants are a thing. Absolutely. That I can say. Any more than that, of course, I can't for security reasons. Okay, fair enough. And um, so you've moved on to some other things as well. What's um? Can I ask what's Heaven Enterprise? Uh, let me tell you first of all something that, of course, I couldn't say a few years ago because I've been labeled, you know, madman, and until I proved that Gemini really works, so actually I'm not so mad. And the matter actually is the academe who really opposed that. But what I can tell you is that Heaven, the, 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 the Heaven Initiative is a three-pronged approach to changing basically everything. Let me explain. Um, the, first, uh, uh, the first thing that the world came to know was, of course, the head transplant thing. Head transplant were meant to to actually either cure incurable disorders or, in my uh, personal approach to this, to extend life because I've been described as a transhumanist. Actually, I label my, I take myself as uh, an ultra-humanist. Yes, I want to extend life even, at, at, you know, at, at a lot of years uh, to, to healthy years to, to, to our to everybody's life. So uh, heaven initially was this head transplant for uh, life extension. Actually, the second pillar I said it three prong. So the second pillar of all this uh, was brain transplants. If you ask any neurosurgeon out there. Uh, they, they will tell you that that's absolutely impossible, that's totally fantastic, blah, 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 blah. I can tell you, I can reveal to you, uh, let's consider this a breaking news, uh, that we, we really worked out uh, one of the two most difficult aspects uh, of the surgery, which is the, 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 the possibility to reconnect the vascular supply, the carotids, etc., in a way which is technologically advanced and totally innovative. Uh, I can give you more details because they will be published soon, but uh, I can tell you that this is a breakthrough for us and that just moved us much closer to a real brain transplant, uh, of course, as usual, first uh, in animals, then in, uh, in cadavers, and then, of course, live. But there is a third, a third pillar of the, the, the entire enterprise that we call heaven. And that is what I, I just published in a newly released book on Amazon, and that's about um, answering a question. And that's the question that uh, probably in some quarters might, you know, trigger some hilarity, but uh, it's not hilarious. Uh, and that is, is it possible? That is the, the real Frankenstein question. Is it possible to revive a brain that has been dead for several hours? Let me explain. When I first thought of a head transplant, my first thought was to uh, forestalling any possible ischemic complication. Let me just just elaborate on that. Uh, when you just uh, detached a head, uh, of course, you had to do that under hypothermic uh, protection. It means that you cool the head to about 10, 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, that is, you stop 
brain metabolism for good for the entire time you need uh, to do your stuff. Actually, you, you just have about 45 to 60 minutes to do that. Happily, we developed a technology that allows us to connect the vascular supply of the head to the donor's body. And so at no time uh, is the brain deprived during the entire procedure of the blood supply. So oxygen, sugars, etc. that is what make the, the, the brain tick. The problem is that when you do stuff like this, you are always scared stiff that, you know, something might go awry, something might fall by the wayside, you just want to be prepared. So my question was, do I have a means to uh, actually block the entire process uh, that that sets in, that kicks in after you, you the, the brain, for instance, in this case during a head transference, uh, goes through a, a period of ischemia, that is no blood, etc. For for in standard neurology, standard neurologists or reanimators will, will tell you that actually it's impossible after four to five minutes, the brain deprived oxygen or glucose is as good as that. Uh, that is something that I didn't like at all because uh, actually uh, the, 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 the procedure or reattachment, the, the vascular reattachment is lasts more than five minutes. So uh, I started to entertain the idea of uh, reviving a dead brain. Actually, this is not as crazy as my sound because if you will just uh, follow the news uh, early uh, this year, an American group in, uh, in the United States uh, um, revived the brains of pigs that have been dead for four hours. That is, those pigs have been decapitated and after four hours, uh, the, this uh, American researchers restarted circulation uh, with a special apparatus, etc. Actually, that was my idea. I've uh, been working on for for several years uh, and now that I published the book, I can reveal that um, a brain that has been deprived of uh, uh, circulation, that is a blood, which means nutrients, uh, oxygen, for more than five minutes, is uh, not at all gone. Uh, that Dr. is. Uh, could I just ask you about those pigs? So, were they um, were they revived as in fully conscious and functional, or just just their bodies? What about their consciousness? Their that is uh, that is an excellent question. That is that is an excellent question. And let me elaborate. If you read the paper carefully, you will see that uh, the revival, the, sorry, the revivification process lasted only a few hours. Number one, and number two, the the the, the resuscitated medium they used, the employed, they utilized, was actually um, laced, so to speak, with inhibitory substances. That is, neuroinhibitory substances. That is, the authors uh, uh, wrapped up their their paper with with, the, with this. Of course, we could revive uh, the the. the the brain, we did not see any sign of consciousness because the revivification process only lasted a few hours. And number two, we just uh, submitted the, the, the brain to inhibitory substances in order to stop any conscious activity to arise. It means that they consider the possibility that the brain could really come back online and imagine a brain detached from the body, what kind of pain, what kind of, I mean, not the pain, but suffering it might entail for the animal. So what I can tell you, we've just been, uh, along with other people around the world, we are just conducting experiments in this regard. And I can tell you this, this is a second breaking news for you, is that the longer and longer means even days of revivification without adding any, absolutely any inhibitory substance, neuroinhibitory substance, you are bound to see much more than those, uh, the, those uh, uh, researchers reported. So it means that and this is absolutely, it sounds like science fiction. It is no longer science fiction. Actually, uh, after the coming out of the, the 
the paper, uh, I decided to accelerate, to, to step on the gas because, the, you, you know, we are all scientists. We work for mankind. We also work because to, to get there first. <laughs> and it is intrinsic to, to what science is. So we accelerated this part of the project a little bit. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely amazing what we have been studying, just like, just like, you sever a spinal cord and that's irreversible. That's the mantra that you all have been, you know, drowned with over the past several years from uh, what uh, Good Morning Britain, an eminent scientist in, interviewed by Good Morning Britain said, it's absolutely impossible. It, it can happen. Actually, it can happen. It happened. And we showed all the videos. So, I mean, we were right. Now, we aim to be right. And I you, we'll be, we're going to be right on this too, on this threat, new threat too, because this is the greatest pillar. Let me tell you, uh, though, why, what is the ultimate goal of all this endeavor and uh, this is also what I, I also published and that uh, I do believe unlike the liberal academia around the world uh, including in, in, in your country Oxford or Cambridge uh, I'm a non-materialist I'm a spiritualist non-religious anti-catholic anti blah 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 religions but i'm a spiritual i believe that consciousness is essential is the, the foundation of all that is around there when we die we don't die of course one way to prove this is and it was the original idea with a uh, hat transplants is that there uh, i imagine well of course in the beginning of course, now it's different because I told you we recirculate the, uh, for the entire procedure. But in the beginning, I said, well, for several minutes, the brain is totally detached from the world. And most likely, I may be able to recreate a near-death experience. You, you are probably, I'm certainly, for, you're certainly familiar with near-death experiences. Uh, the materialists say that it's just an hallucination. Uh, I wrote uh, and I brought evidence uh, along with others that this is absolutely, uh, you know, malarkey. I mean, a near-death experience is for real. But you want to prove your point. And a near and a head transplant really was the perfect stage, the perfect venue, so to speak, to prove this because the head was detached totally. I mean, the, there was no total, no, no, no brain activity whatsoever. Uh, so, I mean, if the patient comes back to life and says, I saw this, this, and this, it cannot be an hallucination. He has to be for real. But uh, imagine what happens. Uh, if we can revive someone who's been dead for several hours or bring them back to life, imagine what kind of experience, what he might or she might be telling us. Plus, plus, and this is equally important, is that uh, this uh, uh, extreme brain reanimation uh, protocol that uh, we are working on is also a possibility to revive cryogenically conserved heads and bodies. As you know, Alcor uh, says that, well, the technology to bring back the this, this subject is still centuries into the future or at least decades into the future. And I say that no. I don't agree with their with their with this view. My my idea is that uh, we have already entered an age uh, when we can, uh, in which we can really uh, bring those brains back to life, and that's what we are working on. Of course, uh, I can't tell you more, but I can tell you this: the, the, the imagine being able to revive those brains and those heads and bring them back to life. Of course, it's just a head they will need a head transplant so a new body you've brought us on to the other uh, topic of bringing people back after they're clinically dead which dr canavero uh his more recent work is focused on and yet yeah, you, you well, certainly couldn't get consent for someone if they're already dead but you would assume they would want to be, be brought back but do you think that's always the case do you think well, I can only ask you to, if you were clinically dead uh, and you'd been dead for, say, 24 hours, um, with modern technology, it might be possible to bring you back after 24 hours. Um, would you want to be 
or is there a is there a time when you think no I wouldn't want to be for example you're a, you're 102 years old and you're you're you're, you're um you're pretty old you're not the uh, young sprightly uh, physical fantastic physical specimen that you you both are at the moment of course um would you want to be brought back i mean for me n no I, I can pretty much definitely say say no if i'm a bit younger and there were certain circumstances that i could see sort of possibly arising that yeah maybe it depends you know but if i've lived a, to a ripe old age you know I, I have no no intention of wanting to to kind of carry on um i think this is we're moving into an area that traditional ethics don't really cover so we tend to be questioning more and more the things that were taboo subjects or considered answered already and this goes back to the rules that I was talking about, these familiar rules, these ideas that we have about what life is about and so on. Like, what is life? What's its origin? What am I as a human being? And does this self, for example, have a center somewhere? Where does it reside? Um, I, so I think we need to move cautiously here, slowly, and sort of feel our way into it a little, as opposed to trying to think our way forward with the usual arrogance of, of human beings. Um, so the, the sort of ethics of this are, are quite they're quite difficult to to kind of point to because it's a it's a completely new new sort of area and yeah for me I, I i don't i don't have any desire to live forever i really don't i think death is a crucial part of life it's the other side of the coin to life they both life is meaningless without death uh personally you know uh I'm 26, but to me, it's nothing to do with age or anything there. If I were to go tomorrow, I wouldn't want to be brought back, partly for the reason of uh, I wouldn't want to put my family through the amount of anguish that they're going to have to go through for any of this to happen. And it, from what uh, Dr. Canavero described, is absolutely horrifying of, of cutting heads off and reattaching them to other bodies and whatnot. There's no part of that that doesn't sound to me, me personally absolutely disturbing not to mention the fact of the astronomical costs and the fact that oh i'm coming back to put the people i love in perpetual debt for the rest of their lives i personally that doesn't really uh, uh sound like too good of an idea to me and then finally i exactly as phil said uh a life without death is pretty meaningless and w when you're ready to go it's it's time to go also that i have no idea where uh, the soul resides whether or not it's even physically possible for my consciousness, Seth, the the entity that I identify as Seth and whatnot, that, that's operating this meat suit that I'm currently in, uh, I don't know that that can just come back because somebody puts electrical impulses to the uh, meat suit itself. Yeah, which, but, but then I kind of think that this kind of work that Dr. Canavera is doing will answer those questions. It will, it will kind of tell us, is life... Um, it, in, in some ways, he, he alluded to... Uh, the idea that um, some of his work would prove, I think he said that it would prove religions to be wrong, but I, I found that I, I, I disagreed with that really. Um, it could prove it to be right, or does it really prove anything? I mean, if you brought someone back 24 hours later, you could say, well, obviously God uh, allowed that to happen. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a confusing, it brings up lots of confusing questions, but maybe some of this work will answer some of those questions. But let's move on to uh, cryogenically frozen people. You know, all those people uh, that we, we all heard about maybe 10 years ago or even 20 years ago who froze their heads, mostly rich people, and people are stu still doing it these days. Um, do you think they're ever going to be brought back? Dr. Canavero thinks that it might be possible. Will it be possible? Let's just have a quick comment on cryogenically frozen people. They obviously gave their consent and they wanted to be brought back. If Dr. Canavero is able to do head transplants and in the future he's able to thaw out those heads, put them on bodies, I mean, that will really, that will answer some questions about what the soul is, uh, maybe. Um, if he's successful in bringing those people back, then it will be it will it will certainly indicate that our soul or our consciousness is still going on somewhere so it would at least from that point of view it would answer that question would it not yeah i mean yeah for me i, I have an interest in that 
it's um and those people have kind of given given consent they sort of have this idea that that um maybe they can come back sort of in a future where which would be better in somehow than 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 what what's here at present on on earth but yeah what it it brings up is um i remember reading somewhere about certain tribes um and one of them was an aboriginal tribe who said they don't experience their center of consciousness their seat of consciousness in the head which is where most people especially people i've come across in the west in western civilization um say that that's where it sort of resides you know somewhere kind of a little bit behind the eyes or behind the forehead that's where the center of their their awareness of of life seems to to come from and so some of these tribes are sort of saying like um well uh, we don't have that we i experience it in the belly that's where most of my experiences first come into my body i feel everything in the belly and that goes along with a lot of uh, kind of western phrases that we have you know where we sort of get afraid about something or anxious about something we might say oh i've got butterflies in my stomach or uh, i have a, a gut feeling about something and um living from the head is something that i think most western uh people in in western society have learned have been conditioned to to experience life in that way especially through our our education system um there are other people i've come across who experience life first and foremost from the heart their chest is kind of like the first thing they they seem to uh to meet life with to meet life experiences with so if these people have just cryogenically frozen their head only and then want to be come back and want to come back in the future and uh this head gets sort of put on another body and and they they rethawed and and revived in some way if that's possible um it might be a bit of a blow to them if they find out that actually their consciousness doesn't reside in the head it it resides is resided in somebody else's body and some lower part of the body or not in the body at all um so yeah i i have an interest in in finding out and and that's where i sort of yeah that's where i'm curious about this work um but but it's as i said before it, it needs to be moved with moved it needs to be uh we need to go slowly with it it needs to be uh it needs to have a certain cautiousness around around all of this yeah and how about you seth um would that be interesting bringing those cryogenically people back do you think uh given my current understanding of how freezing uh body matter works in general uh I don't believe it would actually be possible to bring back people that have been cryogenically frozen due to the very nature of what actual freezing does to water molecules and especially considering that the brain is comprised almost entirely of wet uh, uh soft water molecule tissue or, or high water density tissue it definitely beggars the belief of uh what would happen when all that water expands and then contract or uh, you know what i mean is it's a uh, uh, contracted or rather expanded and then starts to thaw it's going to lead to probably major brain damage to the point that the brain would be completely irreparable granted i don't know this for a fact but given my current understanding of how freezing meat and how freezing more importantly than freezing meat freezing uh, things like brain matter and and soft delicate tissues and stuff like that would actually work and that it really doesn't it's when you thaw something out like that it's not like it would be just oh a okay just slap it on another body and it would be fine but uh to kind of go back of what we were talking about for a second there of uh a 24 hour period of being able to reattach somebody's head in theory though a lot of cultures have the idea that the soul re- remains with the body for uh multiple days in fact many of them uh contending of around 3 days or 72 hours or something like that uh so i mean some people would say that potentially uh, of course they could try and get people back within that period of time but as phil aptly pointed out i don't know that the consciousness necessarily resides in the head and people's idea of that is definitely a very western sort of an idea especially given uh western medicine uh in the last i'd say about 80 years or so that has become absolutely obsessed with the idea of consciousness in the brain uh, especially transhumanists and whatnot with the idea of uh downloading their consciousness from their brain as though that's they already have assumed uh where consciousness lies 
into a computer program or something. I think the uh, cryogenics thing, especially the frozen heads, is very, very similar to that. Uh, very driven by a fear of death and very poorly thought out in a lot of ways in terms of like, like actual for planning. Uh, but it's people are very welcome to try. And in the particular case of consent, I don't think that cryogenically frozen people uh, – would have any qualms about you attempting to bring them back considering it's the very reason that they were cryogenically frozen in the first place so do you know if there's any people that have donated their heads and they've been cryogenically frozen and they would be um they would be able to offer their their head for you to practice and to check whether this is possible is that feasible well uh, first of all this has to be ethical. I mean, we do that sub rosa. It doesn't mean that we do uh, Nazi-like uh, uh, experiments. So first of all, uh, we are experimenting on absolutely on animals first, first step, absolutely. And uh, so I would not accept any such offer coming from whoever around the world because our aim is to bring, not to experiment, but when we do, when we go on that head, to bring that head back to life and only when a body becomes uh, available. So you have, uh, so imagine you have a cryogenically preserved head. So you want to, to, to revive that head, but not like in movies. So you just see that head, you know, detached from the body, just chit chatting with you about, you know, what, what the weather, what, what's the weather, what the weather will be like tomorrow. No, it has to be when, if you do decide to do that, because all animal experience just spanned out. Out, then what you want is just to find a suitable body for transplantation for, for, for the grafting and then starting the process of revivification. Of course, this is like going to the moon and just uh, the technology that, that, that they developed to go to the moon actually found a place in a common life. So I can tell you that this, this EBR protocol I talk about in my book uh, actually could be used uh, in, for instance, for to treat uh, those patients that are labeled as vegetative. Actually, much of this, uh, uh, much of this science, much of this technology um, came came to life in my mind when, for the first time, twelve years ago, I was the first in the world to. Uh, stimulate the cortex of two uh, young subjects in the, the permanent vegetative state. And actually, those patients improved to a minimally conscious state, which was not enough for me, but it was a huge step forward. So I reasoned, if I can do that with electricity, might it be possible to restore a damaged brain in a way that is considered absolutely impossible by contemporary medicine and so that is where we are right now so you you understand you see that there are several threats to heaven and it has the power to change the perception we have of this world of our life of death because in the end death is the number one problem for for everyone you can a big problem that's for sure um i just wanted to ask you a bit about con consciousness basically um if we knew where exactly consciousness was housed would it be possible to move consciousness from a, a diseased brain into a healthy one oh look let me be very specific this is a very nice question and um i can tell you that uh, my answer is a straight no. Um, my idea, not only my idea, of course, um, is that consciousness is not generated by the brain, is filtered by the brain. So the question we might ask is, what is the difference between a brain, which actually when you look at it, looks really like any other organ, and for instance, a liver? or a spleen. I mean, why is it that the brain is conscious or able to experience mm, conscious, conscious mm, consciousness and the liver is not? Um, that boils down to wetware. The brain must have something 
uh, we can speculate on that, but must have something that makes it suitable to filter consciousness. We live inside consciousness. Of course, uh, you might ask me, I mean, tongue in cheek, well, aren't you talking about God? Uh, I don't, I'm not talking about God because God is carries so much, you know, religious, uh, this religious burden that you really want to, 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 do, to do away with. So let's talk about consciousness. Um, and uh, we live inside, we are simulated inside this consciousness. Uh, of course, you, you, you certainly heard about people talking about alien civilizations simulating uh, our, all of us. But I say, just stick to this uh, consciousness with the big C, uh, simulating like a dream in a dream, so, so, sort of, simulating our lives for some purpose inside of it. And the, the brain is what we experience as the filter for this consciousness, for this uh, consciousness to, to, to come alive, to, 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 to be realized. Um, so uh, I can tell you that I don't think that uh, the, the, the trans, the what I call the materialist transhumanist will ever be able to simulate consciousness inside of what, whatever kind of cybernetic brain or whatever, uh, or even download, which is, uh, you know, all the rage. It's been there for more than 20 years, Kurzweil and the guys like him. Let's just download our memories onto a brain, onto a brain so we can just move, perhaps an artificial brain. I think it's just BS, but uh, it's my opinion. I respect everybody's opinion, like I others. Wanted to, um, I wanted to ask your opinion about, I've, I've heard this, uh, this uh, idea before that consciousness and ideas and thoughts might not be even generated in our own brains, but mm. where could consciousness be then? Could it even be off this planet, do you think? Oh, well, uh, the consciousness I have in mind actually is, embraces, encompasses everything and beyond. Okay, let's, let's be specific. I'm... I, I'm not, I don't know if you are familiar with a book written by a neurosurgeon, uh, Proof of a Heaven. Uh, this was a book published in uh, 2012. Uh, the name of this guy is uh, Eben Alexander. Uh, and he was a materialist neurosurgeon. And he had this near-death experience. And in, in, in this book, he says that he saw multiple dimensions, uh, multiple alien civilizations, etc., etc. So let's start from this. Um, let's say that it's not outside the planet. Consciousness encompasses not only the universe we are aware of, and we are certainly aware of only a sliver of it, but let's call it a multiverse or a multidimensional reality. It's much more, but much, much, much more than we ever thought. So consciousness encompasses this all. And uh, there are ways in which uh, this consciousness has to be represented in what we call reality, but actually it's just, uh, you know, one of many possible realities. And actually, if you look at quantum mechanics, it doesn't sound as crazy, because uh, if you uh, look at one interpretation of quantum mechanics, actually there are billions of you, billions and billions of copies of you just uh, acting uh, slightly different from what you're doing right now or what I'm doing right now. So if you just look at quantum, that's why materialists don't like quantum mechanics because it has implications that they're, they're really unpalatable to them. So just to answer your question, it's not outside the planet, but it is everything, including the planets, etc. And I'm happy to say that, that one of the, 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 the staunchest materialists out there, Christoph Koch, the, the, the Allen Brain Institute in, uh, in, um, in Washington, the, the state, uh, in Seattle, uh, just wrote that he, he came to believe that actually all animals must be conscious and perhaps even not, not, not only animals, that consciousness is, is really everywhere, then there are nuances to that, so that perhaps you can feel things that I cannot, but in the end, it all boils down to consciousness be the foundation of life. And you start out from 
consciousness in order to build a science that allows you to penetrate it and to see what, what, what lies beyond. So it's time for the materialists that really sort of besiege the academe, the Western academe, to stop to stop raising their concerns, ill-based concerns that we are not talking science. We are talking science. The problem is that, as I wrote in my book, uh, Immortal, there is a war that has been raging for four centuries between uh, these early materialists and then, of course, the atheists of the 19th century, Feuerbach and Marx, etc., and on one side and on the other side, of course, the church. So since this is really a, a, an infamous war, uh, in order to deny that actually probably religions uh, got something right from this point of view, that is that probably we don't die, actually I'm much closer to, to Eastern mysticism because they, I think it's, they, 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 they really scored big in some versions of it. I mean, uh, this is a huge reality and then blah, blah. Uh, it's, of course, it's it's a form of Buddhism, but of course I'm not religious, but I can tell you that some religions really got it right, uh, at least uh, in, in some respects. So yeah. this is for me good news. Both of you have uh, mentioned consciousness and where it might be, and uh, we did discuss that a little bit, me and Dr. Canavero. And neurologists are saying that consciousness and decisions don't seem to be originating from inside the human brain. And I did a past episode um, on free will where we talked about that before. Um, I think um, neurologists have uh, have uh, used MRI scanners to analyze people br people's brains and give them questions. And it seems to them that people's decisions and thoughts don't seem to be originating in the human brain. They seem to just pop in there, which kind of suggests that consciousness is may, may not be in the human brain. And there's also a possibility it's not even in the human body at all. Dr. Canavero um, believes that the brain, all the brain does is filter consciousness. So could it be that the um, consciousness is outside the human body? It could even be up, up in the sky, you know, in the heavens. What do you think about that? Um, I'll go to Phil for that uh, question. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating question, and and um, I have a, a quote from Jung here, Carl Jung, who says that consciousness does not create itself; it wells up from unknown depths. In childhood, it awakens gradually, and all through life, it wakes each morning out of the depths of sleep from an unconscious condition. It is like a child that is born daily out of the primordial womb of the unconscious. It's not only influenced by the unconscious, but continually emerges out of it in the form of numberless spontaneous ideas and sudden flashes of thought. And when I've considered this sort of thing in, in my own life, in my own experience, when I think of like a decision that I have to make, what is it that makes that decision? And again, when we go back to sort of Western ideas of, of how we live life, we kind of think about the possibilities and then uh, we think we're in control of a, a decision that is the final decision that is made. But when I really look at it, what makes the decision is quite a, um, uh, it's an impulse. A sudden thought kind of flashes up and sort of says, this is the right one, this is the right way to go. And um, and that, that impulse, that thought, comes from nowhere. Like it seems to just come out of, out of uh, a sense of space, a sense of emptiness. And when I look at consciousness inside my own body, I can look at it directly in my head or where I think the center is of, of my consciousness is. And, um, and then I can look at something else. I can uh, imagine like the space in front of me, two feet ahead of me. And I look at that space, I look at that dot sort of two feet in front of my, my eyes, I close my eyes and I still retain the, the idea of that space, that empty space in front of me. And then look for where there's a where there's some barrier. Where, like where is my consciousness? Where does it stop? Where does it begin? And like there's no, there is no barrier. There is no uh, there is no um, 
uh, definition of, of this. So that space in front of me still seem, I still seem to be conscious of that as well as the, the space inside my head, as well as where I think the center of my consciousness is emanating from. And I could do the same with several miles away, or I could do with the, sa the same when uh, thinking about a star way up in the, um, in the heavens. And it seems like there is no, when I really explore it, I look at sort of um, where my consciousness kind of travel seems to travel uh, it doesn't actually travel anywhere there doesn't seem to be any end or beginning to it it's it's like all of this that I'm aware of in my life this entire world every single object every single thought that happens in it seems to emanate from the space that's around us the space that's inside my my body including every single cell every single atom that makes up anything that seems like solid material uh, apparently it's 99 percent 99.999 recurring percent space empty space they can't find sort of solid objects when they really look for them so um i find all of this just yeah it's a fascinating question like what is it, what is what is making up this consciousness? What is making up my awareness of life and and this entire experience of, of the world? Yeah, that kind of um, that kind of uh, converges on the ideas of David Icke that everything around us, no, nothing solid. But I've always found that um, a curious thing. Like you know, he he talks about everything's a frequency, and science seems to be backing this up. That yeah, nothing is solid as such. It's frequency vibrations, but if you hit someone over the head with a table, it's solid. So I've never quite, I've never quite got my head around that. You know, scientifically it may not be solid, but it still is solid if you get hit by something. So it's kind of, yeah, kind of. Sometimes I think that's kind of irrelevant, but I'm, maybe I'm, I might be missing something there. Well, if you don't mind me just jumping in on on that, like if you think about being hit over the head with something, what what is what makes it solid? You know, if you think about that that very scenario you just mentioned, just consider it for a minute. Someone hits you over the head with a table or a, just a piece of wood, and what's the what's the experience of solidity? The table hit me on the head, made of wood. So the table is, you know, that's a word. And there probably a, there's probably an image somewhere in your mind of of that particular table or that particular I'm solid object. <laughs> okay, so well you're looking at one, so that's an image. You know that's an image in in your direct experience. So we've got the thoughts around being hit, the thoughts around what hit you, and the thoughts around what what has been hit, the head itself. And then there's a sensation as well, and the sensation of solidity, the sensation of something whacking you over the, the, the head. And um, that sensation is what gives us the idea of solidity. But solidity, according to science, is really just an um, electromagnetic, electromagnetic um, field, basically. One electromagnetic field hitting another, so they say. But then um, you'll, you'll still see the results. That would make sense, what you're saying there. But if you look at the results, like a fractured skull, it seems evident that it's not just a, it's not just uh, nerve impulses telling you you've been hit, and the table, which appeared to be solid, you can then see the results of the fractured skull and splintered bone. So, um, or everything seems to be pointing to the fact that this was a solid ob object. Well, as uh, somebody that would consider themselves a uh, pretty fluent psychonaut. Uh, of, of sorts, I can definitely tell you that we could have con uh, conversations on consciousness and do an entire episode on this of the very nature of uh, what reality is and where consciousness originates and what consciousness is. But honestly, I feel like we could we could do this all day and go back mm -hmm. and forth of, of all this sort of stuff. So uh, just I have noticed that we haven't. Uh, We've done a really good job of nobody particularly dogpiling on Dr. Canavero or anything, which I was honestly kind of worried about at first because I myself, of uh, as Phil's exact reaction there, finding it a very abhorrent on a lot of levels, but at the same time then having to analyze my own emotions of why I feel this way, uh, I think that it's, it's going to be very creative uh, to try and focus a little bit more on those particular aspects of it. Uh, but just in general, the idea of consciousness and everything – who knows where it originates uh, or what it is. I think the Jung quote was great. It illustrates uh, the fact that for people in general, 
we can have all these different discussions on all these different uh, so-called uh, uh, facts, hard evidence that everybody uh, can talk about and all these, these things, uh, phenomena that we can repeatedly observe and then analyze and overanalyze and overanalyze. But when it comes to something so simple, quote unquote, as who are we, what operates the entire meat suit, what, what makes the brain, which is nothing more than a giant electrical box, what makes that put electrical impulses in the particular order and manner it does to the meat suit what makes us be able to distinguish language and talking to one another and sharing information the why of all of that is something we can't even begin to scratch the surface of or fathom to the point that we could spend like days just going back and forth on this and i think that itself quite easily illustrates the fact that most people in general especially with science of what we were talking about earlier of people's fear of stuff motivating their uh, uh, disapproval of all sorts of ideas that go outside the mainstream. Uh, it it very much shows how people aren't necessarily ready to to see reality as more than what they currently perceive it as. Yeah, and touching on that, um, something I often think about is like sometimes I just stop what I'm doing, uh, whatever I'm doing in the, during the day, and I just. I'm aware. I'm, I'm aware of uh, what's going on. I'm like here, I am. I, I remind myself that I'm on some kind of planet. I'm. I've, I. I have awareness, consciousness, and uh, I, I. I think to myself, what is this all about? You know, uh, I start to think about religions. You know, is Christianity true? Um, is there a God? Is there a creator? Is this some kind of test? And of course, it goes around in circles. It never gets anywhere. I can't answer those questions, but. I'm always amazed that every, a lot of other people just don't even seem to be asking that questions and uh, they don't seem to care and in some ways I think they might be happier because if they're just watching TV and not even they never even give a second thought they just and it it's also ties into just believing everything you're told watching TV and they just live and die and they don't really give a second thought to it all but I feel like I feel like we should or I feel like it's natural to to question what what we're doing here, what this is all about, um, and I I just don't get it. Can I ask you both, um, Phil? Phil, first, do you sometimes stop and think what what it's all about? Does it does it bother you? Do you think? Uh, yeah. To to be honest, I I don't think I haven't. I don't think I have stopped <laughs> for, for like for most of my life. You know, asking these sorts of questions. Um, I had a bit of. A fair amount of trauma in my childhood and um, and I didn't really fe ever feel like I belonged um, uh, and I really tried I really tried to sort of fit in well with with society but it, it just seemed like a an uphill task forever and I was struggling and struggling with it and I was often asking this from from a fairly early age like what what is my purpose here what what's the meaning to all of this um, and I think when people when people fit into a, a group, and that could be any group whatsoever, um, there's a certain comfort to that. And there's a certain safety. And so a lot of people, as you rightly pointed out, you know, a lot of people are quite happy not asking this question because it's fearful. It's scary not knowing. We've all been taught. Um, I think this is actually a fairly worldwide thing, but but um, that's that's just in general a fairly worldwide education system that says we need to know. You know, if we ask a question, we need to have an answer. And you see this in Western society, especially that a lot of people seem very very quick to to respond to or rather react to a certain question. If you ask them, they will draw on things that they've already learned things that they think they they know from books or from a teacher that has told them something and they uh, they suddenly give you this quick quick fired answer for me I, I could never do that I, I i had to ponder on things i really sort of questioned things and and um spent a long time considering uh, a certain question and i came up with all sorts of answers and in a way it it really led to more and more confusion because i never came up with one single answer and in Western society, we're really taught that that's what's needed. You know, um, we need to give the right answer to the teacher if he asks, or we need to give the right answer to any kind of authority in Western society um, uh, that, that asks us something. 
yeah. but I, I don't see I don't see things as black and white in society. So I've asked this question about the purpose a, a lot, and um, and I've become much more comfortable with the unknown, and that's what's scary for people. They don't like not knowing. They don't like uncertainty. They don't like doubt, and they start attacking. You know, you see this everywhere in daily life. People start attacking you if they if you present them with something that's new we already talked about this with regard to the medical profession the medical profession's um uh, uh sort of response or reaction to to this kind of research um but it's everywhere it's really rife in our society that people do not like not knowing because that that's a place that it's kind of less solid it means we're not standing on metaphorically we're not standing on solid ground that feels safe to us um I, people, I kind of like some people feel seem to be quite happy not knowing you know, to yeah. the extent of they don't even care they don't even care what what this is all about and they just assume they assume that it's about nothing you know we came yeah. from nothing we die we disappear and they're quite happy and they also in some ways they seem happier to me because they don't care what's going on and, and they kind of annoy and I me think that's way. okay but I think that's okay Agreed. You know, I, I, like people are, are at certain stages in their lives where to ask these sorts of questions would just be too traumatizing for certain people. They're not ready for it. And this is how, if you ask me, this is how uh, evolution kind of happens. It's a gradual sort of process where we, we're presented with certain challenges and things to learn in life. Um, and those are the things, whatever life kind of throws up at us, those are the things that we're given to learn from. So stick to those kinds of things. And most people who don't ask this question about what's the purpose of life, they're being presented with other challenges. And for well, those who are... Fair, they're watching, you know, most of them just seem to be watching soap operas and, and not doing that much. So I don't know. But outside of the soap thing. operas... I don't think it's a healthy thing necessarily, but I'm not in their bodies. I'm not walking there, you know, walking in their shoes. They'll have other challenges presented to them outside of the soap opera time. Soap operas, television, video games, whatever, um, whatever other things there are, are, are essentially just distractions from what is uncomfortable. You know, exactly. we're, we're, life exactly. is all about certain things that we're averse to and certain things that we we desire in life and the the aversion things we tend to we tend to we tend to avoid them through distraction so, and that could be drugs alcohol uh any um any kind of of media entertainment or, or whatever so um I, I think it's okay for the you know for people to be where they are but for those who you know, really need to ask this these questions the the, the deeper me about the deeper meaning of life. I think you know that's what we're that's what we're ready for. If that question pops up, then you're kind of ready for it. Okay, um, let, let's uh, let's see what Seth thinks about that. Uh, if I didn't question uh, what it means and the world around me, I don't think I'd be on this show, Scott. I don't think I would have taken up making music. I don't think I would have been involved in uh, activist independent media since, oh my God, like 2013, 2014, something like that. Oof. But just in general, I think, uh, again, as Phil said, it doesn't necessarily mean that people uh, are any less conscious or anything like that just because they don't ask a lot of the questions that we're asking uh, because in my opinion regardless of what they believe what's going to happen to them is what's going to happen to them the same way as what's going to happen to us is what's going to happen to us when it comes to the answers to all these deep questions uh we're all going to find out eventually or not or not it it is one or the other and i mean great Granted, unless you accept uh, certain particular religious viewpoints and whatnot in which either uh, none of it means anything or all of it means everything. And if you made the wrong decision, you you go to the bad place forever. Uh, personally, I think beyond that sort of stuff, there's there's not a lot that we necessarily know concrete. Uh, but again, you know, people are afraid of that. I think one of the most important things that brings people – uh, answers to a lot of these questions or even brings their minds to a lot of these questions is, uh, well, oddly enough, what Phil was talking about earlier of uh, feelings at times of alienation, especially in youth, uh, can get you to become introspective on a lot of stuff, uh, whereas people will call that being antisocial and all this uh, uh, sort of nonsense. In reality, 
everyone is taking the time that they have and is it, your brain and, and your consciousness are, are analyzing all of this stuff the entire time that you're in waking self literally interacting with people or not you're doing something so in cases of people that aren't learning uh, deeper people skills or deeper empathy for other people or anything are learning more about themselves and about how they feel and about uh, how they perceive the world around them and everything and i think everyone is in everyone is where they need to be to a degree i mean people can people can change people can better themselves but i also don't necessarily like the idea of throwing my particular perception of what is better than or what they would be better spending their time doing than somebody else because i mean i know a lot of people that think that our time all three of us uh, our time would be better spent doing anything else in the world than having this discussion here kind of there do you think that you or, or someone else would be able to prove one day that we don't die or our consciousness doesn't die that it that you know I mean if you could prove that um, we could come back after after someone's been clinically dead for like uh, even a year for example then surely that would yeah. prove that we don't die um, when we think exactly we exactly and that's my sworn my sworn intention to prove exactly that absolutely and what that's is, what why do you think there's it. so much resistance to your work amongst the medical profession uh, Oh. I presume that's true to say, right? That they, they don't seem to be <laughs> too enthusiastic about some of your work. <laughs> well, I would call. Wait, wait a second. I would call that a British miss. Uh, understatement. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but uh, let me read you what I, I put on uh, on the one of the on the, the, the front not from but the, the second page of my my book it, it's one of your i mean conventional that's francis bacon mm -hmm. by far the greatest obstacle to the progress of science is that men think things impossible number one and because we are weak Big changes always bring about anxieties, always bring about new views that many are not ready to, 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 to accept and many are not up to tackling first because our brains unfortunately are not all that developed. But number two is that, let me be very clear, perhaps not so smart, don't call me arrogant, but I would say that the academy is replete with a, a bunch of, uh, uh, <clears throat> let's say, idiots, okay, the word should convey the meaning by itself. Uh, the, the father of biochemistry said, discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. Uh, that means simply that uh, you get resistance for several reasons. One of the reasons uh, has to do with, of course, the power. Let me be very specific. If we prove once and for all that you, when you die, you don't die, religions are out of the equation. Religions, dead. It means just imagine by yourself on your own, what it might entail, killing religions because you, I mean, religions are based on our fear of death. If you just remove that fear, because science proved that we can, that the consciousness is immortal, imagine the consequences and repercussions worldwide. Religions are off the grid. I mean, all these people that are there for, for power uh, are gone, uh, millions of people that believed in this and that came to believe it, an entirely different thing, well actually not entirely different because it's still, hey, you, when you die, you don't die, but on, on different grounds, totally different grounds, and imagine then from another point of view, for instance, very soon we will announce that the, the, the Gemini protocol uh, is, is being deployed in uh, in paraplegic patients there will be there will be mark there will mark the end of paralysis spinal paralysis uh, this news will come very soon uh imagine why all this opposition simple it's the money 
I'm not adding stoop because I'm not referring to you, of course, but um, imagine all those ac academicians or researchers around the world just to draw their, their, their living from getting funds from, you know, patients associations that are there just to, to bankroll whatever rat study they come out of, then they could go to the next journalist and say, hey, we just made this, you know, mouse walk just two steps and it's big progress. They are going to be out of a job because when you just cure a spinal cord injury, the, the kind of paralysis, I mean, you have thousands of people just been working there for decades that are out of a job. But imagine also the economic impact because wheelchairs will be gone, etc., etc., etc. So there are several reasons why this opposition might arise uh, and it has to do with power, uh, it has to do with money, and uh, in the end, human stupidity. So this is, of course, my opinion. I don't talking pretend... About, um, talking about money, um, would it not be a bit unfair? Like, if this, if this does work and people can get cryogenically frozen, the only people who could afford that would probably be the rich. Uh, wouldn't that be unfair that they're going to get to live forever and oh, the, the normal yeah. man on the street might not ever be able to afford that? So you'll have, you'll have a two-tier society of the immortals versus the mortals. Absolutely. So uh, I was in uh, Glasgow uh, in November 2016 and at the end of my presentation, a guy just raised the hand and said, what about pensions? So. Before moving on to a split society between immortals and mortals, uh, we also to look at the possibility of just having this technology being uh, employed across the board for more than billionaires. Because let's say that the state will pay for that. But if the state, the state pays for that, for, for this kind of surgery to, 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 to prolong life, it's gonna break the bank. Because I mean, you, you, you're going to, 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 you will retire and you will draw your funds for decades. It will break the bank, state banks. But uh, of course, what you said is absolutely true. And uh, someone just, you know, brought that to my attention. And I just replied, look, I am a technician. I am a researcher. I am a scientist. I am not a ethicist. I'm not a politician. I'm not, I'm not, not all those, those things that might make me rethink the whole thing. I am curious, I want to push the science forward, but I fully agree with you 100%, let's say 1000%, that this dystopic scenario you have, you have raised is absolutely feasible. In the 21st century, the, the rising gap, the, 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 the sort of the increasing gap between the haves and the have-nots is going to get worse. And those people, and all of those people, just or just a, a bunch of people, will be able to, to benefit from the surgery if the state or people refuse to talk about this. Uh, so that's one reason I'm talking to you, because this is a, a great question, and people had to think hard about what to do with this technology. In the end, you can also tell me, look, Okay, you prove your point, it is feasible, right, but we don't want it, we don't want it. But actually, if we look back, uh, at, at, you know, at the first atomic bomb, you didn't want an atomic bomb. You really didn't want an atomic bomb. You wanted nuclear energy, perhaps, but you didn't want an atomic bomb. But mankind moved forward because, because we, are, we, are, we are stupid. And uh, I'm pretty sure, totally sure, that in the end, the scenario, the dystopia you have just mentioned is going to happen. Anyway, you cut it. Anyway, you slice it. It's going to happen. So be warned. Be prepared. Uh, that's up to society to, to, do, to do something about that. I agree with you. And maybe my final question would be uh, about immor immortality. And maybe you co covered this in your book. I, I don't know. But... Uh... Immortality would probably come with some psychological issues as well. Those people living longer would have to have a lot of their friends dying, you know, um, 
uh, you know that's been covered a lot in a lot of vampire um, TV series. But uh, mm -hmm. do you think this this could throw up some psychological issues if people were were uh, to live much longer lives? No, look, I, I, what you just uh, raised, I don't, I don't see as a problem. Let me explain. When you are on, you know, on, on, on the brink of death. You are staring down into the abyss. Well, losing your friends or those you love, perhaps, but you know, there, there is a, 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 an irrepressible instinct that we all carry inside that is to live. So, in the end, I think that's not the problem. The problem is another, in my view, of course, it's, it's just, we are just, these are just opinions, is that boredom. What, uh, let's say that now you are, you, you, you are allowed to live another, say, 100 years. Um, what about doing the same kind of stuff you have been doing? Of course, you might say, I've been an artist for, for one life, I'll be a scientist in another life, etc., etc. But in the end, are we sure that living so long uh, is going to be a good thing for, for, for those who, who just inherit this possibility? Because, you know, doing the same stuff, it's, it might be get boring because whatever activity you are into, uh, at some point you, you just say, well, my gosh, I want to change. I want to do this and that. I mean, it's going to be, there's going to be a psychological burden along the way that I cannot really fathom at this point, but uh, there will be consequence. I mean, uh, too much of a good thing can turn into too much of a bad thing. So in the end, we can extend life, but perhaps not all will be up to it and be able to live it in full. So I, I, I see there are several problems to this. Now I'm a technician, so I'm free to say, let's talk about you know fix, fixing the, 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 the car and then getting rolling again. But what you do with the car, or what's going to happen, well, that's up to you. Okay, great. Well, um, hey, it's been great chatting to you, Professor Canavero. And I, I wanted to ask, um, where should people go if they want to find out more about your work, like read some of your books? Or do you, do you have a website or anything? Well, uh, I used to have a website, but uh, given the opposition, uh, we just uh, sort of switched off. But you can just go on Amazon, you will find all the books. And uh, of course, uh, for those who are into these researchers, that's Medline. PubMed, where we publish our reason where they can find our research. That's the largest repository of uh, scientific articles in the world from the National Library of Medicine. Uh, but both Amazon and uh, Medline will will do the trick. Absolutely. Well, I hope maybe we can uh, check back in with you again sometime in the future. In fact, when, I'm, when I'm 80 years old, I'll definitely be giving you a call to see if, uh, Absolutely. if you've progressed. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, you Dr. For... Canavero. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. I think over time you can work certain things out. In fact, um, since I started Truth Sentinel um, some years back, We've had so many discussions. I've interviewed a lot of people. I'm making and I'm putting splicing a lot of those together to make this documentary, which will take some time. I put part one. By the way, good job on that, Scott. I saw the first part of that. That looked absolutely awesome. Oh, great! Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to be. There's going to be quite a few parts. It's basically going to be all the guests, maybe some of our chats as well, thrown into a big long documentary size um, video. Um, but I do feel like it. There has been a learning process. I, I do feel like by talking about things and um, discussing, you can work little intricacies out. You might not get the answer to everything, um, but sometimes I wonder whether you, you do find out some of the answers when you die. I hope you do. Uh, if if conscious lives lives on, I hope we do get the answers to some things. But um, probably I think now is probably a good time to have our final thoughts and comments on this topic, pulling it back to the work of Dr. Canavero. So feel free to talk about any ethics of it. Um, I think Seth was going to talk about the fear of death and how that uh, comes into this as well. So if, um, I'll go to to, um, to Phil first, just to wrap up. Um, but um, if we bring it back to the work of Dr. Canavero, what are your final thoughts and feelings, Phil? So around the ethics of it, I, I'm, I'm, I lean more towards what, uh, what Seth was saying earlier about 
using animals for for this when when in your interview with Canavero he mentioned about removing the head of a pig and replacing it on another body i yeah there was there was a lot of revulsion there and a lot of um empathy i guess you know i i don't really like animals being used in that way um there's also an ethic about the wealth inequality, which you'd, you'd mentioned to me before the show. Uh, you know, only, only people who are, who are rich are going to be able to do this for, for the foreseeable future if, if it works out that this is, this is a successful procedure. Um, in my opinion, the rich are, are welcome to immortality if that's what they want. You know, I think a serious question has to be asked around all of this. It, which is what we've we've sort of been alluding to through a lot of these questions like what's the purpose of life um to me I, I don't want immortality and i do see part of my purpose as being just to live well as best as i can each day <clears throat> and uh and that that would include a lot of kindness you know like kindness to other human beings and an ability to empathize an ability to understand at least try to understand where someone else is coming from because we tend to we tend to grow up with this universal idea that everyone is experiencing life in the same way and it's just not true and seth you you were talking about this just just before just before this and um yeah, we, I think part of our purpose is to give our own meaning to daily existence. I'm sick of listening to any people who have an, a sense of unearned authority around life. You know, I have a, I've had a lot of people in, in my life try to impose their opinions on onto me to say, like, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. You shouldn't feel this, you shouldn't feel that. And I, I used to believe them, but as I went through life and as I really uh, contemplated all of these these things, I realized they're, they're kind of full of crap. You know, when pe people impose their opinions on someone else and uh, and say, this is this is how you should be living life or this is how you should be viewing life, they don't even realize that it's just an opinion. It's just an ideology. And this is my life. This is my life to do with what, what I want to to do with it. And I think that's a part of living life well, is realizing that we're our own authorities in life. I have my own unique experiences, my own way of doing particular things, even simple tasks that someone else might say, this is a better way of doing it. But for me, this is, this is the best way of doing it. And to sort of continue finding out that that's how, I, that's how this body works, that's how this mind works. Um, that gives a diversity, you know, an amazing diversity to to how people live their lives. And I like diversity and I like to give my own meaning to my daily existence and to allow that meaning to be fluid. So you mentioned this earlier, Scott, you know, you you, you have this idea that we, we can work things out. To a certain degree, I, I agree, but we keep working things out. I, don't, I never seem to get to a particular conclusion that is then solid and set in stone. As I continue to, to change along with my experiences and my growth, my meaning that I add to life is, is uh, changes with it. So meaning to life sort of seems to need to be fluid and to have any fixed idea of, of uh, what life is about and this idea that we should be living, we can live um, immortally, um, I think that sort of shuts shuts ourselves off, such shuts ourselves ourselves off from uh, the continuing learning experience. You know? I think we're always sort of, as Seth pointed out earlier, that we're always learning every single day, and a lot of that learning is unconscious, and that sort of adds to to our experience of of each day as it goes along. Yeah, well done, Seth. Uh, well done, Phil. That co that covered a lot of aspects there. How about you, uh, Seth? I know you were going to say something about uh, some of this may come stem from the fear of death and definitely the fear of getting older as well. I, I'm aware of that. As I, I'm thinking, 20 years from now, is that something I'm really looking forward to? You know, so um, yeah, feel free to wrap up, Seth, and um, cover any ethics and things like that. Alrighty. Well, uh, first, before I forget, uh, you said at the very beginning that uh, the reason that uh, Valerie decided not to go through with the human head transplant and everything is because he found love. I think that's absolutely beautiful. And uh, honestly, that would, I was under the impression that he had uh, passed away, and that was the reason that they hadn't gone through with it or anything like that. But that is that is great. Yeah, uh, in 
Exactly. Exactly. And I think in general, uh, Dr. Canavero, with the exception of uh, what we're talking about with the animals and whatnot, which, uh, again, I saw another thing because I was doing some research on him and whatnot because I wanted to be prepared for this. Uh, He has stuff of talking about uh, cutting off a rat's head and putting it on the body of another rat, but like not in place of its head, but just in addition to it and just stuff that is in such absolutely bad taste that there's a reason even uh, certain regimes that were engaged in some pretty nasty stuff in the late 1800s and early 1900s banned things like vivisection because it's a spe- – well, animals. You're doing it to a party that can never consent, and that alone is absolutely a- abominable. Uh, granted, when it comes to – as we discussed, when it comes to people that are willing, then honestly, sky's the limit, man sky's the limit as long as people are willing to do this i fully believe in uh adult consent especially to things that that are furthering the human understanding of reality uh obviously as somebody that's seen uh the human bodies exhibit i happen to know that not all uh experiments and things that further human understanding of the body and of life around us uh, necessarily come with the consent of the people being used for uh these projects and so I very much so want to stress that that's the most important part of any of this. Uh, Personally, I don't think that Dr. Canavero is going to have any luck with uh, his pursuits, but also as uh, not trying to be super rude here, but he seems like the sort of guy that he'll be able to hustle whatever he needs regardless of whether or not he succeeds. Uh, But in the rest of it and everything as far as consciousness, fear of death, Uh, I think we've, for the most part, touched on all of that. I think fear of death in general, everybody just on a surface level can understand, motivates nearly, I'd say, somewhere like 80% of the decisions that human beings make on a regular basis are literally, even uh, uh, unconsciously or subconsciously, uh, influencing their decision-making process on a regular basis. People are afraid of the unknown, and death is the ultimate unknown, because regardless of what one believes and with one's religious systems and all this sort of stuff, or lack thereof, you still don't know. And that lack of actual knowing is what builds fear in a lot of people. I think one of the most important things people can do, especially people considering uh, human head transplants or any sort of really, really sort of stuff, because in general, I think that fear is always going to be negative in terms of what it creates because what motivation goes into something means a lot to what's going to come out of something and being afraid and pushing all this technology super fast as quickly as they possibly can to try and cheat death just seems it seems childish it seems absolutely childish and again when we talk about the wealth aspect of all of this and the fact that if somehow this were to be a thing it's the uber rich that would get uh, that would have this i also think that itself is sort of uh just sort of plays into the whole classism thing and everything like that because honestly they're not they're not going to it's the idea that people especially poor people love to fantasize that rich people will have some sort of mega uber good life that they're living it up and yucking it up while all the rest of us are laboring out here when in reality all of these people have their own challenges as well and yeah granted a lot of them aren't exactly savory people but it's they have their own problems to deal with and if their problem i guess is a uber fear of death that is going to motivate them to the point of chopping their head off and sewing it onto another body in an attempt to uh to cheat death than more power to them. As long as consent is had there, I don't really think any of it should be illegal or honestly as panned as it is in the media. I think most of people's problems with Dr. Canavero's work specifically stem from uh, both the fact that some of these cadavers aren't necessarily like, because yeah, they, they volunteered for their bodies being used for medical experiments or, or anything like that, but didn't necessarily know that they were going to be used for something like trying to reanimate somebody which is really weird and uh then also specifically the animal aspect because that lack of consent and all that sort of stuff shows a pattern that has been really 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 uh uh, disparaged through our modern history because even with people's ever-shifting moral compass there have been people that in all time periods have had a serious problem with vivisection due to the very idea that just because you can does not mean you should. And I think that's about all I got to say on it. 
Yeah, well, that's plenty. Mm -hmm. um, so we've covered a, we've covered uh, a lot of topics today, and um, I think that whilst you might be right that some of these projects are going to fail, I, I, you know, I think I think it's unlikely they're going to be able to bring someone back who's been dead for more than a week, uh, and it, uh, because I think maybe consciousness is uh, I think and th I think you mentioned this uh, prior to the show that. Uh, that it's more in, uh, in wrapped in the soul. The consciousness is your soul, and you can't bring back something that you have no control over. It's not like maybe parts of our bodies are machines, but there's a mysterious part that's uh, beyond machine, uh, the soul. And um, so, if they fail in these experiments, then it might prove that the soul does exist. It's we're not. There's a certain part of us that we we will never be able to control. And maybe um, I hope that we do find out some of the answers when we die. But in the meantime, we'll keep talking about it. Um, thanks for both coming on the show today. It was nice to chat to you. And well, I hope we have a few more chats in the future. Thanks, um, Phil. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you both or to hear you both. And um, see you again soon. See you again soon. And thanks again, Seth. Uh, it was very good to be here, guys. It was good to talk to you, Phil. Uh, anytime you guys want to have another uh, roundtable discussion on anything, I am more than up for it. Just give me a couple days' notice so I can do some research first. Will do. Thanks a lot, guys.